Good morning, happy Sabbath. Please stand with us as we bring in the spirit of the Lord.
Okay, there we go. There, let me start all over again. Good morning, Kansas Avenue. <laughs> you know, it's so good that we made it back, and I'm going to say it all over again. You know, I see some of you all throughout the week, but the ones that I don't see, that I see on Sabbath mornings, I love seeing your face in the place this morning. It is so good to come into the house of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you this morning. We're here. We're obedient to the command of the Sabbath, and we say thank you for communing with us and convening with us, assembling us together, Lord. And here we are this morning to give you worship, glory, honor, and praise, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Stay, remain standing, and we will recite the fourth commandment together. Let us start. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt no, no work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger within thy gates. Because in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, and therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Amen and amen. Ushers, if there's people waiting, you can let them in, and you may all may be seated. Amen. <laughs> God is good and all the time. God is good. Happy Sabbath, Kansas Avenue. And good, good morning. I, my name is Tracy White, for those who don't know me. And I am here today to welcome you to Kansas Avenue. We are very glad that you came here off of a busy week. It is always nice to fellowship with the saints and just be in the sanctuary in God's house. We are glad that if you're visiting with us that you just enjoy and be blessed and for the members we're also glad that you are here. We're glad each and every one of you are here today. So please just enjoy and worship Christ today in spirit and in truth. Pastor, our members and our visitors. Hold on, hold on, Sister White. What, what was that dance you were doing just a few minutes ago? <laughs> Y'all say amen for Tracy White, everybody. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And I am happy to be here in the house of the living God. We serve a risen Savior here at Kansas Avenue, and it's so good to see your faces on this Sabbath. We'd like to welcome all of our friends who are watching online. You're watching the most watched black church broadcast on the West Coast. So thank you. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for joining the best church west of the Mississippi. We really, really appreciate it. Now, if you look around, you'll notice some people aren't here because we're in two places today. Uh, we are having and restarting our children's church today. And all of the kids are right next door. Now, I see some young people in here. Uh, this is your chance, parents. If you've been sitting in church, say, man, it sure must be nice to worship without kids. <laughs> today is your day. So you can take your children to my right, your left, you can check them in. They'll be nice and safe. 
I even have secret security guards over there. They're off the books. They're unofficial. But if you try to mess with our kids, it's going to be a problem. But you can take your kids next door, and you can come back here and worship with the adults. You are welcome to do that today. Uh, and that's why we're a little divided today, but we're going to have a Holy Ghost good time in both spots. We also have our Pathfinders with us today. Come on, say amen. Many of our Pathfinders are serving the children's church, but great things are happening in the future for our Pathfinders, and I'm going to ask our directors to come forward at this time to share a few things with you about Pathfinders. Can you give Brother Harris and Brother Hewitt some love today? Good morning, church. No, good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Well, Brother Hugh would already told me I'm the uh, Kansas Avenue hype man today, so he told me to get up here and do my little thing. Anyway, we want to um, thank everyone for your donations that you've been providing for our campery. We made up about $15,000 so far. Can I get an amen? With your generous help, generous help, you felt us out so much. We truly appreciate everything you've been doing for us. We have a couple of things that we will be doing um, here at Kansas Avenue. On May the 25th, which is Armed Forces Day, our Pathfinder program will be presenting um, the Armed Forces um, with the Color Guard and things such as that. But we're going to have a Pathfinder night that night here at Kansas Avenue. Um, we will be inside the upper kitchen and the youth room and things such as that. And when our glorious gym gets done real soon with the donations from the church, we'll be able to go downstairs and have fun with everybody else. Got to get an amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So um, my biggest thing is right now, we just, we've been doing so well. We want to thank the church for all your donations. You've been helping us out. Continue to donate to our Pathfinder organizations. If you have anything, type of fundraiser you want to help us out with, please let us know. We're diligently waiting to help you guys out for you to help us out. Anything else? That's it, Pastor. We just want to just say thank you for everybody else helping us out, okay? Thank you, okay? Amen. I'll say amen for our Pathfinders one more time. The Bible lets us know I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we pray that you have a wonderful experience today here at Kansas Avenue. We want to greet one another in the name of Jesus. Put a smile on your face. You know, even if you came to church sour today, if somebody gives you a hug, it's going to change that. We're going to run the devil out of here. Is that all right? So we're going to ask everybody to stand to their feet. Our wonderful praise team is going to sing at this time. Shake somebody's hand. Welcome them to church. Tell them happy Sabbath and enjoy fellowship today here at the best church west of the Mississippi, the Kansas Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Church. Come on in where the table is spread.
children are next door for children's church if you'd like to participate in children's church just head to your left right into the upper kitchen and they're having a fabulous program today for all of our children I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine here of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit Washed in his blood. If you were washed in his blood, let's sing this out today. Blessed assurance. Perfect submission, all the ladies, ladies only. Here all the ladies. This is my story.
got, we got some, we got some serious hymn conductors in this church. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Have mercy, praise the Lord. This is my story. This is my song, and I'm sticking to it. Yes, indeed. <laughs> God is so good. Happy Sabbath, Kansas Avenue. Wonderful to see you all here today. And we know Sabbath School is flourishing, both online and in person. God is so good. He's going to get his word out no matter what. So we're grateful to be here to bring you up to date on the status of our members. Continue to pray for Sister Lori Preston Eaton, Sister Jewel Kibble's health and her family, Deacon Greg Smith, who needs a kidney transplant, and his brother Herb Smith, Sister Mary Eliza Simpkins, Deacon Anthony Reynolds, Sister Lillian Neal, and Brother Anthony Neal, and Brother Jean-Pierre Thomas. Keep praying for Sister Camelia Hawkins, Sister Cassandra Miller, her father Chucky Miller, or Charles, Sister Bonita Harrington Cummins, Sister Betty Abrams, Stephanie Stevens, Sister Yvonne Wren, Philip Grayson, and Lorraine Chavez. Philip Grayson has been brought back to California. He was in Alabama for a while, but it didn't work out, so he's back at his home in California. Sister Van Bryant's daughter, Danielle Bryant, still needs our prayers. S Sister Tony Eccles reports, the parents are doing fine this week. They're getting out and walking. Plus, Carl is still having eye appointments. Thank you for your continued prayers, calls, and visits. Keep those fervent prayers going up for Brother Fred Bryant. His situation now requires divine intervention. Last Sabbath, we announced the passing of our dear brother Enrique de Velez. Continue to show his wife, Melody, his family, and loved ones the love and support they need during this time of loss. Arrangements will be announced when they become available. We're still praying for restoration of health for Dr. Winston Richards, Wayne Dooley II, for Sharon, who's fighting cancer, and for Mr. Mario at the VA hospital in La Melinda. Remember, the service for Sister Lucille Vaughn, the mother of Sister Stephanie Vaughn, will be held on April 18, 2024, at 11 a.m. at the Thompson Rose Chapel and Mortuary, 3601 Fifth Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95817. Let's continue to pray that God will provide the peace and comfort that only he can give to Stephanie and her family. Let's keep praying for Maneo's mom, Sister Jane. She's at home recuperating from her latest hospitalization. We pray that God will once again bring her through the serious health challenges she is still facing. Don't forget to pray for the three unspoken prayer requests that we have on our list. The service for longtime former Kansas Avenue member Brother Julius Madkin was held on April 3rd at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Covina. You can continue to send condolences to his wife um, at uh, 539 Sonoma Court, Ontario, California, 91762. We're still praying for the Muhammad and the McGinsey families. Please remember Richard Lawrence and his daughter Yasmin as they mourn the loss of her mother, Dawn who died on March 21st from a rare form of cancer. Also pray for Richard and his daughter for the challenges ahead as they work to rebuild their relationship. Brenda Alexander says, Larry's surgery went well on Tuesday, praise the Lord. He's stable but weak, now begins recuperation. Please continue praying for us. Also, my brother-in-law, Henry Kennedy, the father of Sylvia Kennedy, passed away on Tuesday afternoon. Please continue to keep our entire family in prayer. Thank you for your faithful prayers and support. We're also saddened to announce the passing of Brother James Lee, who used to attend our church. Let's keep his wife, Millie, his family, and loved ones in prayer for peace and comfort during this time. He was one of Brother Bill Howe's best friends. More information will be shared when it becomes available. And we've asked this morning to just say a special prayer for the Gary and Cassandra Willis family. She's asked me just to ask the church to pray for them. So that's our list this morning, church. Uh, we want to commend you and ask you to continue to visit, to support, to provide care and love to those who are suffering. And uh, when our time comes, somebody will take care of us as well. May the Lord bless you. We want to pray for your family today. 
Sometimes, if we are not careful, we let demons into our home. You want to give me, let me give you a telltale sound. And you may laugh at this, but it's true. Softly, softly, gentlemen, softly. You, you, you may laugh at this, but it's true. If your house is really dirty right now, might be a demon in your home. You can never get it clean, no matter how hard you try. Cleanliness is next to, but another, if you're fussing all the time and there is division, today, can be the beginning of the next step for your family. But it begins by saying, Lord, it's me standing in the need of prayer. So I'm going to throw out a few categories today. You got a grieving family. You've lost a loved one and you're struggling with it. You got an argumentative family. Nobody gets along in the house. You have a broken heart. You feel lonely in your own home. Spirituality is not thriving in your house. You're saying, Lord, I need to introduce the Holy Spirit back to my house. I want to love my spouse like I used to love them. Watch this, watch this. Lord, I wouldn't mind a spouse. Come on, somebody say amen in the house of the Lord. I just want to take some time praying for families today. Is that all right? So if you want to bring your loved one to the altar, if you want to stand in the gap for your child, Lord, bless my wayward child. Lord, continue to put your hands on my sick child. Whatever it is, if it has anything to do with your family, can we pray a blessing over you today? We're inviting you to come on up to the altar as we pray this morning. And we pray for families. At the altar, you can tell Jesus all about. At the altar, you can tell what your heart everybody in this middle aisle, if you could step forward so we can disperse across the front, that nobody feels they're in the back of the aisle. That's good. Come on. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you're in your seats, couldn't make it down today, but you're saying, it's me, Pastor. Just lift your hand where you are. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into your presence today. We are thankful that you have been good to us. And before we say another word, Lord, we say thank you for being a provider. Thank you for looking out for us. Thank you for giving us this holy Sabbath to worship you on. Thank you for this wonderful church that you can receive our praises. Lord, on this day, we come with grateful hearts. As bad as it is, it could be worse. But for that, we say thank you, God. Lord, please forgive us for our sins. And give us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from thy presence, Lord. Amen. Give us a second chance. Make us over again. 
on this morning we acknowledge our wrong. We acknowledge that we didn't do it right. We acknowledge that we have secrets. We, we acknowledge that we have not always represented you. But Lord, I hear the song say, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Wash us and make us whiter than snow. On this morning, we're praying for families, God. We're praying for families. On this Sabbath, Lord, bless somebody's mama or daddy. Bless their grandfather or their grandmother. Lord, bless somebody's cousin today, God, or auntie. Be with somebody's uncle or step relative in the name of Jesus. Lord, while we're calling on family members, will you bless our children, God, in the name of Jesus? Whether they're two years old or 72 years old, Lord, be with our kids, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, please be with our sick family members right now. We got family members in nursing homes, in hospitals, in rehab centers, in hospice care. In the name of Jesus, come on in the room, God. Be the doctor, be the medicine, and bless our families in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're going to just call it out today. Solve disputes right now, God. In Jesus' name. Be with the couple on the verge of divorce and bring them back to you, God. In Jesus' name. Be with the newly divorced and let them know there is hope beyond the pain. In Jesus' name, God. Lord, the estranged sibling, may somebody have the courage to pick up the phone and say, hey, there's nobody more closely related in DNA than us. Let's fix this thing. Do it for somebody today, God. Be with people who are estranged from their kids and mend the relationship, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, today I pray for the lonely heart. I pray for somebody who may be on their own saying, Lord, I would, I would like a good friend. I would like a spouse. Lord, you are able to provide. As you provided for Adam, provide for somebody on this day. Lord, be with the grieving families who miss their loved one at the table, who still have their loved one's number in the phone, who wish they had one more opportunity to say they love them. Bless their hearts at this time. Stand by them. For our sick loved ones who are watching online, Lord, today let them know there's hope in Jesus Christ and that your power is with them. And Lord, I pray a special prayer today over families. May your spirit reside with them and may your power keep them together. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen. 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 Come on, shake somebody's hand. Let them know God loves them. Amen. At the altar, at the altar, you can tell. You can tell Jesus, Jesus all, all about. At the altar, at the altar, you can tell. You can tell.
Hallelujah. Let's give God some glory, everybody. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If I got a phone call that I, uh, that Michael Jordan received my letter <laughs> when I asked him for $10,000, and he'll be responding to you, so I celebrate. And I'm here to let you know God has heard your prayer at the altar. Somebody give God some glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's time for our tithes and offerings. Uh, we're going to ask for our uh, deacons to make their way up. As they come, will you accept my gratitude for what a giving church this is? Come on, say amen. amen. We thank you for being faithful in your tithe and your offering. For those who may not understand, your tithe goes to the Southeastern California Conference in order to pay the salaries of our teachers, our principals, our administrators, and to do world mission. If you stop giving tithe, I'd be planning my farewell next week because there'd be no way they'd be able to keep me on board. Your offering, your offering stays here at the local church and it makes sure that the air conditioner works. Come on, say amen. And makes sure that we can take care of our bills and our expenses and it makes sure that we can do ministry all across the Inland Empire. We appreciate it. For those who are not familiar with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, let me assure you, the pastors don't go in the back and divide up the money. We promise you that. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> All right, some of y'all like, nah, it's not true. I promise you. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. We'll never get rich off doing the ministry, but ministry is something that we love. Come on, say amen. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your giving. And let's make sure we continue in that path. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the giving that takes place here at Kansas Avenue. Help us to continue to be faithful to you and not rob you in our giving. And may your power be on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. While the offering is being taken up, I'm going to invite Shara to come forward on behalf of Community Services, and they're going to make a special presentation on this morning. And y'all know it's important when Clarence is setting up his camera. <laughs> All right, when Clarence come across the front, y'all know it's important. Somebody has told him, be ready. <laughs> Good morning, church family. For those of you that don't know, I'm Shara, also known as Sister Shara. I'm the community service leader here at Kansas Avenue. Let me give you a brief history because I don't want Pastor to have to tap me on the shoulder. Um, for approximately 25 years, a little over 25 years, Hazel Johnson was the director of community services. Um, even before then, she took children, she took people into her home. She foster parented a little boy named Eugene and for fear that he would get adopted or be taken from her, she adopted him. Then she foster parented a little boy named Joseph, just 10 days old. He, his mother was um, a drug addict, so she had to nurture him from the withdrawals. She didn't want him taken away, so she adopted him. At 13 months, she adopted a little girl named Shara <laughs> for fear of, of, well, she foster parented me first, and then for fear of us being taken away, she adopted. Her husband would not allow her to foster parent any more children <laughs> because she was such a loving soul. She's taken in people from the community into her home. She's adopted and, and um, just nurtured some of you here. She did Bible studies from her home. She, and that generation, they sewed clothes. They were real Dorcases. They sewed clothes and patched clothes and, and, and re, uh, reused the clothes and stuff. Um, this was Hazel Johnson. So when you hear today that we are gonna award someone the Hazel Johnson Recognition Award, it's special to me. It's special to our community. 
So I'm going to read this card real quick. <coughs> Thank you. It says, my dearest Selma, you are such an absolute blessing to my heart, my life. God has strategically placed you in my life personally, spiritually, and in ministry on purpose. You have been in the embodiment of the legacy of Hazel Johnson and beyond. I know Mother B would be so proud of you and your own personal growth. There's no way that I could, everything's going blurry. <laughs> There's no way I could ever repay you, but I know our Father will give you super strength to carry that jewel studded crown awaiting you in glory. I will miss your hugs and your smiles. Zelma <clears throat> is preparing her heart, is preparing our hearts to move back east. And so before she leaves, and I thank God for this, the time that he's given her to us, before she leaves, I just want to acknowledge her and her preciousness by awarding to her the Hazel Johnson Community Service Award. When I came to California, I missed my kids and my church. Then I met Sister Hazel Johnson. They said, God always sends someone for you in a time of need. I would go down there. She, luckily, she didn't stay for, for me. I would go down there, and she would say, baby, you will get used to California. I said, but the, the people's not friendly. Like, she said, just ask God, and they will be friendly to you. So that's what I did. Sister Johnson, but one thing, I was scared of her daughter. <laughs> I would go there, I'm going to tell it real fast, Pastor. I would go there and I say, is she at work? And Sister Johnson said, yeah, she's at work. And so I watched, I learned what her car looked like. But when she got a new car, she fooled me. <laughs> I was sitting up there at Sister Johnson just having a good old time. And she walked in the door. I said, bye, see you later. <laughs> but I just want to thank you for the cheering your mother with me. My pleasure, my pleasure. I'm gonna read the plaque and then Sister um, Karen is gonna share something. The plaque says the Kansas Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Church is honored to present the Hazel L. Johnson Community Service Award to Zelma Jackson. Amen. And it's presented today by Pastor Donovan Washington and, and Shara Johnson. Don't go anywhere. You are loved. Truly loved. So from the deaconess, I have the honor of being appointed the next head deaconess. I'm walking in big shoes. She's leaving a legacy to this church. One that I'm going to honor and one that I'm going to try so hard to feel. I'm presenting to you today from Kansas Avenue SDA for the years of service as head deaconess and the legacy that you leave behind. In honor of this legacy, 
deacons, present and past, are going to be presenting you with cards from now until you leave. I present you the first two cards of many to come. Come on, let's say amen one more time. Amen. And we thank God for her. Wayne Dooley, if you could join me up front, please. Got one more piece of good news. Where is, is Anthony Reynolds here today? Come on, bro Reynolds. And not the slow, smooth walk either, bro Reynolds. You got that slow, smooth walk. Let's, let's put some extra time on it. <laughs> Thank God for our head deacon. Kansas Avenue, I am thrilled to announce to you all, after 20 years of frustration, construction has begun on the renovation of our bathrooms in Salter Hall. Come on, say amen. Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. It gets better. By the end of June, we're going to have new bathrooms. We're going to have a ribbon cutting. And we're going to thank God for how far he has brought us here at Kansas Avenue. I want to give special thanks to our Treasury Department and our Finance Committee under the leadership of Billy Hewitt. I want to thank our deacons, Anthony Reynolds, who's the finest head deacon west of the Mississippi. I want to thank Wayne Dooley. Now, now hear me closely. Contrary to popular belief, this is not our janitor. This is not a deacon. This is our building manager, Elder Wayne Dooley. And he has brought us thus far. Can we say amen? A lot of work is going to be happening in the next couple of months. We're going to be introducing ways that you can better relate to these gentlemen because we take them for granted. We expect them just to magically pop up and fix everything, lock up, open, clean up. And there's a better way that we can take care of the people who take care of us. So we're going to do that very, very soon. But let's celebrate Kansas Avenue. We are on the way. Now, please, do, do me a favor. Don't go down there messing with stuff. <laughs> okay? Don't go down there with your cameras today, okay? Now, the good news is we don't let them work on the Sabbath. Come on, say amen. But they're going to be there every day of the week. And once we get it done, we are going to celebrate. Let's give God some glory for great things that he has done. Thank you, gentlemen. As I take my seat, uh, a colleague and friend of mine is here with us today, and you have known him from the Inland Empire right now. He is one of the leaders who is helping individuals and companies and organizations realize their full potential. And this is none other than Seth Yolorda. Come on, give him a hand. <laughs> Pastor Yolorda is on his way to getting a doctorate. And Kansas Avenue is going to help him get his doctorate. And he, and he briefly, unless you got a song, briefly, praise team, y'all come up when he's done. But <laughs> he's briefly going to tell you what he's working on and how you can help. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. So I'm just so honored to be able to, to invite you to participate. You know, I believe that God has a call on everyone's life and that in addition to that call, there's an assignment on everyone's life. And I feel like the assignment that God has placed on my life during this season is to come alongside of leaders and organizations to help them better serve the community. 
And so I've been partnering with churches and hospitals and nonprofits to help them figure out how we can better deliver our, our services, our products, our, our programs to individuals in the community so that we can lift the community. I don't know if you have that slide ready that you can put up there for me, uh, but a part of my doctoral research that I'm performing now is to better understand volunteers. How many of you in here have ever volunteered in the church before? Amen. Most hands are going up. You know, Matthew says that, uh, I think it's Matthew 9:37 says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Have any of you ever been in a situation where you wish you had more laborers to help you in your ministry? Yeah, right here, down front. We still, some of us are still experiencing that. So what I'm doing in my research is I'm trying to better understand volunteers, why they volunteer, what their motivations are, what their preferences are from a leadership perspective so that the leaders of the church and the leaders of organizations can figure out what, what levers they need to pull in order to create a more dynamic experience for individuals. There was a day where people just volunteered because that was just the thing to do and they love the Lord so they go and volunteer. Some of us still fall into that category. A whole lot of folk don't fall into that category. And so it's not enough just to say we need to have volunteers because it's your duty to the Lord. No, as leaders, we need to figure out how we can create an environment that is conducive for you as an individual, as a member in the community or in the church to be able to give your time, your energy, your service to help this ministry and this cause. So I would, I would love for you to just take out your phones, scan that QR code. I believe that this flyer also went out in the newsletter and uh, you can access the survey there. It's just a 10 minute survey. I'm not collecting your emails, your phone numbers. I'm not gonna call you. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a voluntary, voluntary serve survey. Uh, you're not gonna get any, any benefits from, from, from taking it. You're not gonna get entered into a drawing for a $25 Amazon gift card. Uh, none, of, none of that. Um, you're just gonna help contribute to our, our, our knowledge on how we can create an environment for our volunteers to thrive here. Is that all right? So thank you, Pastor, so much for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me, phone or email, and I would love to talk with you about it. Amen. Y'all ready to praise and dance and lift up God's name high. Amen. This song is called The Name of Jesus is Lifted High. We're just going to go up real quick. Oh, 
of an army arising. I hear the sound of an army arising. I hear the sound of an army arising.
Whatever I've needed you to be, I, those who know me know I'm not free with emotion. Um, Dillis, you did not have to be that loud. But um, I guess in the midst of listening, that whatever I've needed him to be. There are things that I don't talk about. And it's those moments when you've been alone. Whatever I need you to be. Do I have anybody here who's just needed him to be whatever? I needed him to be a friend, he was there. I needed him to be a confidant, he was there. I needed him to be a, a kick in the pants, he was there. I needed him to be a parent, he was there. Whatever. I've needed him to be. He has been there. And I'm thankful for the God who is the great I am. If you appreciate God being the great I am, why don't you put your hands together on today? If he's been whatever you needed him to be, appreciate the ministry of our worship team on today. I need to make this quick announcement. If you are a young adult or think you're a young adult, on uh, next Sabbath, we will have another young adult fellowship meal together uh, right after service. We're going to be at somebody's house. I'm just not sure which one yet, but uh, you will get that information this week. But next Sabbath is our young adult fellowship meetup. We'll hang out and eat together. Amen. Uh, with that said, if you have your Bible or whatever you read your Bible on, I'm going to invite you to open it to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. I believe we have it in the ESV. I got the NIV. I need to switch to ESV. The Bible reads this way after he had finished oh you can stand for the reading of the word <laughs> and he had finished after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people he entered Capernaum now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they had come to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him. 
for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I, I too, am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. This afternoon, for the next few moments, we would like to speak under the subject, not in my house. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your love. And we thank you that whatever we've needed you to be, you've been. Now, God, we ask that your blessing would remain in this space as we share your word. God, hide me behind the cross of your son, Jesus. Cover me in his blood. Seal my lips. And allow your spirit to speak to your people in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It's an interesting thing to see someone care so much about someone else that they would go out of their way to see that person or those people be blessed. I found it intriguing that this man who had power, as he says, was a man of authority, like many of the people in this room, to want his servant to be healed. I, I need you to think about this a little bit because the servant is someone that would have been acquired after uh, a victory of the uh, army. So the servant is never looked at as a friend. The servant is property. The servant is something that was acquired. If you spent enough time within these United States, you can recognize, you've heard a few times about people who were looked at as property. It's interesting that this man, this centurion, this person of power, stature, and maybe even a little bit of influence desired that his property be healed. I wondered to myself, what is it that this servant had on him? What was it that the servant knew that he wasn't willing to let go of? What had he shared? You, you can imagine that there may have been times where he let his guard down and this particular servant uh, sat there and listened to him while he talked about what happened on the centurion elders board. Maybe the centurion was present when he was uh, going to centurion uh, PTA. I don't know, but whatever it is, the servant had particular import for this centurion. There is an amazing study that was done a while ago about the practice of medicine at the University of Rochester. The study was called the value of physician self-disclosure in creating successful patient-physician partnerships. See, when the physician is talking about him or herself, this is what it's basically talking, and they got a hundred people who the physician would not know who they were, and they would come into the physician's office, and some of these people were actors, 
and they would sit down and the physician would go through what physicians go through. Everyone here has been to a doctor once or twice in their lives. For some of you men, you need to get to the doctor. <laughs> it shouldn't be once or twice, but you, you know. Anyway, what they found out is when doctors self-disclose, it seems it's a way to establish rapport or, or that they were lonely and needed someone to listen to them. What ended up happening is that the doctors shared more with the patient that didn't have to, anything to do with the patient's health simply because they were, needed somebody to talk to. And so they would share. I imagine this is why or how we end up in this situation for this centurion. He had spent time talking to his servant because he was lonely. We have an epidemic of loneliness in our world today. Devices and screens and ability to not have to go out has caused many of us to become lonely. We're by ourselves. We uh, scroll on screens and sit up in the middle of the night with the incandescent glow of our devices keeping us awake until we can't do anything else but fall asleep. Then wake up to said same device without ever talking to another person. You're able to get your news. You're able to get your information. You're able to even get your doctor report I had a video doctor's appointment this week because I've had a pain brother Duffy in my shoulder which was radiating up to my neck for almost four weeks and the first three weeks I was in so much pain I couldn't sleep through the night Uh, and I went to urgent care here in Kaiser. Kaiser uh, went, sat on the line for so long for just the doctor to be look at me and say, well, there's nothing really I could do about that. Uh, take this, this, or this. And I took the things and I ain't do nothing. I was still in pain. So this week when I actually talked to my doctor, because it was the fastest appointment I could get, I didn't even talk to the man standing in front of him. I had to look at my screen and say, this is what I'm feeling. Now, because it was four weeks ago, it has lessened. Still uncomfortable, but not the way it was. And maybe some of you can be familiar with that feeling. You've been by yourself even when, you, when there were a lot of people around you, you felt by yourself. I guess when I heard the song today, I was reminded of all of the moments of when I was by myself. Growing up the way that I did, I, we spent time. I'm not going to ask y'all if you were the latchkey kid. I ain't going to do it. Most of us were if you're a part of Generation X. That was just the way the world was. As a elementary school kid, I got on the bus at second grade to go to my new school. I was third grade. I was by myself. When I went to middle school, I had to walk to school a mile and a half, just about, by myself. When I had to go to high school because my mother wasn't that familiar with the things that happened in order to get to high school, I had to figure a little bit of that by myself. I didn't know who to talk to. I'm wondering if there are people in the room that have felt that feeling of who do I talk to? This centurion was like, I'm not going to give up who I've been talking to. I need some help. The Bible says he heard about Jesus. 
by some church people that he knew. The church folk had a building campaign that they encouraged him to contribute to. (laughs) And the centurion had some funds that he contributed to the building campaign so they could build a synagogue, a synagogue that he could never enter. They might have put his name at a door, but he would never be welcomed inside because he was a Roman. He was not a Jew. But he heard about Jesus, and he is thinking to himself, there must be a way for my servant to make it through. If this Jesus is all that they say he is, I need this dude to come through for me. And this is what the Jews do. They go over to Jesus, depending on your version. Luke's version says the Jews went and talked to Jesus. Matthew's version says the centurion went up to him himself. I like the Lucan Luke, Luke version because it does this particular thing. It sets up a, 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 a situation where church people went to Jesus on the behalf of the Roman to tell Jesus, go help our friend because he gave us money. Not because they want to see him saved. Not because they care about his soul. Not because they care about him. This dude gave us money to build a synagogue. Jesus, you owe him because he helped us. And the, the, the thing about Jesus is like he ain't even stunting them. He sees someone in need. There is something about the need of people that draws Jesus to him. He can't walk away. Y'all can remember that woman in, in John 4, I believe, was at a well. She, he was pulled toward our must needs go to Samaria. Jesus got this thing about him that need pulls him towards people. There was a woman with an issue of blood, and she found herself just touching the hem of his garment. God, Jesus could feel himself be pulled away as something about people when they are in need. So so Jesus, the Bible says, is on his way to the centurion's home. And this refrain rings out in both versions. I am not worthy for you to come. How is it? That the centurion can have enough faith to see his servant healed, but not want Jesus to come to his house. See, this is where I got stuck in the text. I always, I look at the text and I'm thinking about why or how what the situation looks like. And it makes sense. Jesus just has to say a thing. Servant is healed and everybody's happy and he goes about his business. But I'm struck by the fact that the Jews thought he was deserving because he had given money. Yet the Roman felt he was not worthy even though he had authority. Why does he feel he is unworthy? Maybe it is because he gave money to a church that won't let him in. Maybe it's because the Jews kept telling him that he was unworthy because he is not a Jew. There is a challenge with people of God that when we are not in church, we can act a way that make other people feel like I don't want to go to wherever they go. Because you can show up at the job begging me money for your pathfinders, asking me for money for your building plan, asking for money to support whatever auxiliary is going on at your church. But when I'm in trouble, when I need a word, 
I can't find you. When I am by myself, I don't get a phone call, I don't get a text, I don't get a nothing, an email. You couldn't even look at me and say, dog. So this centurion is struggling with knowing God has power to heal his servant, but not feeling that he is deserving of God's presence. How many of us are satisfied with God's word, but never want his presence? You've been living off of the word, the promises of God, but you've never sought to be in his presence. The struggle is this, is while we can accept God blessing us and things that we can see on the outside, in all of our lonely places, there's some stuff that we've gotten used to. In all of our lonely places, there are things that we are comfortable with. Maybe you had to do it just to get through, but you got stuff in the house. I'm not talking about the place you live no more. There's stuff on the inside of us that has to be changed, but we're not willing to let him in. I'm satisfied with what you're doing around me. I love the blessing, but I don't want to change. I love what you do, but just don't do it in me. Because that would be uncomfortable. Therefore, our centurion continues or lives in the idea that I am not worthy for you to come. He was comfortable. The, the centurion had, uh, he says that he is familiar with power. He knew authoritative power because he was a man of authority. He had the power to get things done. He had reward power. He had the ability to provide incentives or rewards in exchange for compliance. He had coercive power, the ability to punish or harm others to achieve compliance. He had positional power. The influence that comes from one's specific position or role within an organization or social structure as a centurion. As the Bible says, he was a man familiar with power. He could have been on anything. The centurion school board, the centurion elders board. The centurion was not unfamiliar with power, but he recognized that he did not have all power. And now he needed to get into the presence or in the proximity of Christ. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Yet, the centurion felt of himself, I am not worthy for you to come to my house. He was, and many of us are, unwilling to submit our house. It's all right for Jesus, for you to heal my servant, but for you to come into the house, then something would have to change. And I'm not confident that there are changes that I, I am looking forward to. Listen, I believe in your ability to heal. So rather than come into my house, do your thing with my servant and we're good. We are not questioning the faith of the centurion. Jesus speaks positively about the faith of the centurion, saying that he has not seen faith so great in all of Israel. And here's what's messed up. This dude's faith was great to see something happen on the outside of him, but not for the change that could have been 
on the inside of him. So that seems to me that he had partial faith. He had enough to see one thing, but not enough to experience something else. Are, are you still with me? Yet that little bit of faith that he had was greater than all of Israel. I'm wondering if y'all still with me, that even though you've seen blessing happening all around you, why aren't we willing to allow him inside? There are a number of us who are just like our centurion. And I'm struck by the fact that the centurion had an opportunity not afforded by many. Jesus was coming to his house. He was on the way. Both versions, Matthew and Luke, say the same thing. Jesus was on his way, and he stops him. And he chose not to do it because he felt unworthy. Why? How did the Roman citizen in a position of power come to believe that he was unworthy? There are a number of us here that have done the same. We have seen Jesus coming our way, and for whatever reason, perhaps we've been living a double life or not being consistent in devotion. Maybe we're still holding on to self-destructive impulses. Whatever the reason, we feel that we are undeserving. You ever have a friend that you, are, you, you, you both go out to eat and you want to pay the bill and the friend get mad at you like, don't do that. What you mean? Don't do that. I, what do you mean? I just want to, you're my friend. I want to pay the bill for you. It's, it's my blessing for me to do this for you. And they like, nah, I don't like that. What, why you don't like that? I don't like people doing things for me. You know people like that? Because then you're going to quote unquote owe them. Or they don't think it's worth, they are worth it. Would the songwriter say, you thought I was worth saving. We're not done yet. How can we use temporal things to fill what only can be filled by God? As a result, we struggle with feelings of loneliness and self-doubt. Anybody felt that way? We, we, we've allowed the enemy of our souls to trick us into believing that because we were undeserving, the king of the universe will not come to our homes or live within our hearts. We are comfortable with his power but struggle to get in his presence. We are fine with getting the blessing, but we don't want to deal with his body. We want the miracle but not his majesty. So the centurion says to himself, I am not worthy. His heart, uh, um, Emma White says this, his heart had been touched by the grace of Christ. He saw his own unworthiness, yet he feared not to ask for help. He trusted not to his own goodness. His argument was his great need. His faith took hold upon Christ in his true character. He did not believe in him merely as a worker of miracles, but at the, as the friend and savior of mankind. Yet, he didn't let him come to the house. Like many of us, we want God's help. But what he wants to give us is his heart. But then we say, but I am not worthy for you to come. And then he responds, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then we say, but I am not worthy for you to come. But he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption they came by Christ Jesus. But I am not worthy for you to come. But then he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But <laughs> I'm not worthy for you to come. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us since we have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Yes, you may have been unworthy, but you do not have to stay that way. You have felt lonely, but you don't have to stay that way. You've been living in self-doubt, but you do not have to stay that way. The invitation today, let Jesus in the house. Most of us, most of us have grown up in places and in spaces where if you had, you, you were, there were rules your parents had rules and they would declare at some point, not in my house. You ever heard that? You're not going to do that in this house. And unfortunately, so many of us are saying the same thing to God. Not in my house. And God looks at you and says that you don't own that. <laughs> What made you think that you own that? See, I was there in the womb when you were knit together. You see, I have known you from the foundation of the world. No, that house belongs to me, and I'm on the door knocking. Let me in. That is a lie and the trick of the enemy when we keep thinking that we are unworthy, when standing before you today is Jesus, Mary's baby boy, Jesus, the carpenter's son, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, my redeemer, Jesus, my savior, Jesus, the lily of the valley, Jesus, the rainmaker, Jesus, the bright and morning star, Jesus, the resurrector, Jesus, the overcoming, Jesus, the victorious king, Jesus. All you have to do <laughs> is let Jesus into your heart today. Y'all remember that, that uh, we say let him into your heart. And it takes you to that song when you were children. Uh, let him make a residence there. Y'all remember then let it, let the flag in the castle. Yes, the castle of my heart. In the castle of our heart. Let the Fly high in the sky and let the whole world know that the king is a resident there. So when we start our days, we are not letting Christ have, we need to let Christ have the run of the house and not limit him to just the Sabbath room. You got to let him out of your devotional closet and let him be a part of the whole day. Take the limits off, and God wants to um, amaze you because he don't just want to help your friends out. He don't want to just uh, increase your bank account. He don't just want to make you smarter. What he wants to do is to change your heart. So the things that have been, you've been driven toward, the things that you felt like you needed, you no longer need because he is enough. The challenge for me every time I read this, we come back to it, is that I can't understand when he knows the power that Jesus has, when he is aware of what Jesus can do. He believes it because the, the Bible goes on to let us know that the servant is healed. When they go back and see him, servant's healed. He knows this dude got power. I think to myself, When I put myself in the centurion's shoes, if I were there on the road, speaking to the God of the universe, I might have been tempted to say, even me, Lord, even me, 
Even me, Lord, even me. Let some drops now fall on me. Some of y'all living long enough, you might have thought a little differently. You might have thought some folks would rather have houses and land. Some choose silver and gold. These they treasure and forget about their souls. I've decided to make Jesus my choice. Do you want to make him your choice today? Some of you might have just had to fall to your knees and acknowledge, pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. Yeah, I'm calling Savior. Savior. Hear my humble In the building today, you know what it feels like, like that centurion. You're by yourself. You felt like you were by yourself. Jesus is on his way. Don't stop him. Let him in. Let him in. Let him in. Listen, there's a whole lot of people in this room who have, who live with authority. You're used to telling people what to do. You are used to moving things. Y'all are movers and shakers. You're, but yet, you know, the heart, man, the house ain't, don't got Jesus in it. Today is your day. Let him in. I don't care what's been going on with you. This is your day, your opportunity. He's on the way. Are you going to open the door? Yea, I stand at the door and knock. Will you let him in? There are cards in front of you if you're one of those people who are dealing with loneliness, self-doubt. If you were like me, you felt like everything you've had to do, you've had to do it by yourself and you're tired. It is tiring. You've gotten used to doing things that you did not need to do. You've harbored hate in your heart, resentment for people. And all this time you felt like you were unworthy, you were undeserving. 
of God's love for you. Today is your opportunity. God's love is not limited by your mistakes. God's love does not stop because you did the wrong thing. God's love doesn't stop simply because you, 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 you went the wrong way. We invite you, if you are willing, to come down front. You do not have to. Not everybody wants everybody to be in their stuff. Fine. There are cards in front of you. Grab a card. Our Bible counselors are available. Now listen, don't let, don't let Jesus pass you by. Don't let him pass you by. Because he is whatever you need him to be. The challenge always is, when will he do it? How long will it take? I'm going to tell you now, it'll be quicker than you realize, but slower than you want. But if you trust him, let him in. Let him start cleaning stuff up for you. You will find yourself in spaces and in places that you never believed you could be in. You are worthy. You are worthy of what everything God has for you. Let's pray, everybody. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your love. God, we thank you that we're never alone because you're willing to walk into our homes and make a change in us, for us, and then through us. So now, God, today we're asking that you would be with those who are under the sound of my voice or even watching online who have been struggling with loneliness and self-doubt, that they would know that they are not alone that you are always available to them and that this church is available to everyone who needs a friend, who needs a family. We are available for that as well. So God, do what only you can do and we'll be sure to give your name all of the glory, honor, and praise is what we pray in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen. amen. If you love the Lord today, why don't you put your hands together? If he's been whatever you needed him to be, I need you just to say hallelujah. God is indeed good to us. We serve a good God, amen? We serve a mighty God. Before we close today, because uh, we don't have any children in here. Oh, what should we do? Matea, come here. Um, if you've been getting or if you've gotten a one call, a vocal, a voicemail to your house, raise your hand if you've gotten one over the last two weeks or so. If you've ever gotten one, you can put your hand up. If you've not gotten one, um, we don't have your phone number. And we want to be able to get people's information as we're moving forward. So in the next week or so, you'll be getting the information in order for us to have all of the relevant information so that when something an emergency, something arises, you will know um, by the voicemail. And if you're a person who doesn't want voicemail, raise your hand. All right, y'all are good with voicemail. Uh, for the folks who would rather a text, we have a way to take care of that as well. Um, we'll talk about it more. Can we do that next week? We'll talk about that more next week. We'll give you all of the information that you need so that we can all be on the same page, know what's going on at church, as well by looking on your phone, and you'll have all the relevant information. Matea Brooks, daughter of mine, best daughter in the world, would you mind giving us our benediction? Oh, it doesn't even matter if you mind, because I already called you up. Pray for us, please. Jesus, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you that we all could come to church today and please help everyone to have safe traveling mercies back home or wherever they're going. And help us to have a great rest of our day. Amen. Amen.
all of your problems, all of your pain, even your troubles, you can give it to Jesus. All of your birds, all of your cares, even your struggles, you can give it to Jesus. Cause he won't fail. 